Good morning. We're delighted to welcome you to morning prayer for Temiskaming Deanery on Trinity Sunday. And this is a special Sunday, a very special Sunday. This week we did celebrate the birthday of the Venerable Joan Locke, who is our Archdeacon, and so we hope she had a wonderful week. We're most delighted to welcome the most Reverend Anne Germond, our Archbishop and our dear friend as our preacher this morning. I'll be leading the service. My name is Marie Lowen. Our reader is the Reverend Dr. Derek Neal and our musician is Mrs. Janet Parfit. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Our first hymn this morning is Holy, Holy, Holy. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning, my song shall rise to thee. Holy, Holy, Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, open our lips. And our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. 
Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. O come, let us worship. And I invite you to say the Venite with me. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with songs. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hands are the caverns of the earth and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his for he made it and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee and kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two, they covered their faces, and with two, they covered their feet, and with two, they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the thresholds shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me. I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And I invite you to join us as we say Psalm 29 together, a psalm of great praise to God. Ascribe to the Lord, you gods, Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is upon the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is a powerful voice. The voice of the Lord is a voice of splendor. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedar trees. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf. And Mount, Her <clears throat> and Mount Hermon like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord splits the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the oak trees writhe and strips the forests bare. And in the temple of the Lord, all are crying glory. The Lord sits enthroned above the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forevermore. The Lord shall give strength to his people. The Lord shall give his people the blessing of peace. God of mystery and power, Open our eyes to the flame of your love and open our ears to the thunder of your justice that we may believe, receive your gifts of blessing and peace to the glory of your name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. A reading from St. Paul's letter to the Romans. So then, Brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. 
For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And we invite you to sing along as Janet leads us in King of Kings. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes. You fulfilled the law and prophets to a virgin gave the word from the throne of endless glory you were cradling the dirt. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, in one. God of glory, majesty, forever to the King of Kings. To reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross. For even in your suffering you saw to the other side, knowing this was our salvation, Jesus for our sake you died. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. In the morning when you rose, all of heaven held its breath, till that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had long put death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who had come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. be with you and also with you the holy gospel of our lord jesus christ according to john glory to you lord jesus christ now there was a pharisee named nicodemus a leader of the jews he came to jesus by night and said to him rabbi we know that you are a teacher who has come from god for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, 
Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of heaven without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I say to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it, go where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we have seen and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. And now may the Lord be in all our hearts and upon my lips, that every thought and word may be spoken wholly for the honor and glory of God. Amen. So good to be with you all this morning in Temiskaming. Thank you so much for the invitation to be your Trinity Sunday preacher. Well, the icon um, that is up on the screen now is the icon that for several weeks has been on the windowsill in my study at Bishophurst, where I say my morning and evening prayers. This icon is called the hospitality of Abraham and is the quintessential icon of the Holy, Holy Trinity which marks this Sunday and is a day for us to celebrate the joy of worshiping a God who is as complex as the Trinity and yet wants to know us fully and wonderfully. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. This icon was written by the Russian iconographer Saint Andrei Rublev in 1411 for the abbot of the Trinity Monastery in Russia at a time when many people were confused about the doctrine of the Trinity and some in fact rejected it altogether. They were not alone. When Thomas a Becket was Archbishop of Canterbury, he stipulated that one Sunday in the year be given to the doctrine of the Trinity because he was astonished at how little people at that time knew about it. Well, it didn't seem to have done the trick. 
because a guidebook at one of the local abbeys in England said this. Here in the chapter house, the monks gathered every Sunday to hear a sermon, except on Trinity Sunday, owing to the difficulty of the subject. Well, the icon of the hospitality of Abraham is based on the narrative account in Genesis 18 of three messenger angels who visited Abraham and brought to him the promise that his wife Sarah would bear a child. Rublev depicts the three heavenly figures sitting at a table with a cup placed before them. It's thought that from left to right, the figures of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're equal in size. Each one holds a rod in his left hand, symbolizing their equality. Each wears a cloak of blue, symbolizing their divini div divinity. And the face of each is exactly the same, depicting their unity and their oneness. God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer, signify that God is pure relationship. One of the most beautiful symbols that I know for the Trinity is three interlocked circles, love intertwined. God's perfection, you see, is in God's closeness rather than in God's distance, in God's communicativeness rather than in God's silence. Above all, the Trinity is about loving relationships. What a mighty God we serve, sings the old praise song, indeed. And it is always God who takes the initiative, who calls people into relationship with God, only for us to be sent out on a mission in the strength and power of the sustaining Holy Spirit. Now in the first reading today, we listened to the call story of the prophet Isaiah. Imagine the scene with me, if you will. There's Isaiah praying in the temple when suddenly he sees a vision of the Lord, the Almighty, seated on a throne, high and lifted up. And Isaiah is drawn to the throne. The whole sanctuary is filled with smoke. And the smell of holiness is all around. Angels are there too. Their voices echoing throughout the holy place. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. One of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is the fear of the Lord, which we are told is what seizes Isaiah in this moment. He literally comes undone as he is struck by his own unworthiness and the unworthiness of his people. He knows his own sin and he knows his people's sin, for it is ever before him. And the first words that come to his mouth are words of, of confession. Woe is me, for I am lost. In those words, I hear echoes of Psalm 51 when David confesses his adulterous affair with Bathsheba. And I hear again in them the parable of the lost sheep and the good shepherd who leaves the 99 to go and find the one sheep. 
the God who is not distant and harsh, but close and forgiving. There is a deep mystery at work in this passage from Isaiah and in Isaiah's experience. And it is profoundly unsettling for him. But in the upsetting, Isaiah is able to confess his sin, is cleansed of his guilt, and receives a clean heart. And it is only then, when he has made his confession and has been forgiven of his sins, that Isaiah can hear God's call with clarity. Whom shall I send and who will go for us, booms the voice of God. And through burned lips, healed lips, Isaiah yields, here I am, send me. Isaiah says yes. Over the years, others had and would resist the call and the potential to upend their lives. Daunted by his call, Jeremiah objects on account of his age. I'm way too young, he says. And I'm very inexperienced with public speaking. Confounded at the burning bush to deliver Israel from slavery in Egypt, Moses comes up with a long list of excuses and finally pleads with God to send someone else. When God calls Jonah to go to Nineveh to indict that city for its wickedness, he heads in the opposite direction towards Tarshish, only to be sent back in God's way to get the job done. But Isaiah immediately and willingly accepts the divine commission from God and enters into a new and lasting relationship with God in which he would literally become God's eyes and ears and voice. Isaiah's vocation would be one of truth-telling, calling the people of Judah to account and to bring them back to God. That moment of Isaiah's yes represents a pivot point in the history of God's people a moment when the arc of the story starts to move in a completely new and definitive direction. There is an historical context for this moment, the death of Uzziah, which marked a transition from a time of political stability to unrest and the looming invasion from Assyria. But that historical moment also becomes a kairos moment, a moment in which God's plan and purpose became clear. And Isaiah was God's instrument, God's messenger. It was far from an easy task. We all know, don't we, that a true vocation and calling is never easy. Jesus invited his disciples to take up their cross in order to follow him. But the ultimate intent of Isaiah 6 and Jesus is to invite faithfulness and discipleship. And Isaiah wasn't only a prophet of doom and gloom, he was also a prophet for a new and peaceable kingdom. You remember this beautiful passage which we read every Advent, a passage of hope. A shoot shall come from the stump of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and might, 
the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And a few verses later, it will be a peaceable kingdom where the lion will lie down with the lamb. If we go back to that icon for just a moment, whenever I pray in front of it, I see an empty space at the table, an invitation for me to enter the sanctuary of life in the Trinity, to offer myself to God and to pray Isaiah's bold, here I am, Lord, send me. Those divine pivot points or those kairos moments don't often arrive with burning bushes or smoke or angels, do they? At least they never did for me. But if we look back at our lives, we can all often remember a seemingly unremarkable but decisive moment in it. On a whim, we go with a friend to a youth group and it sets us on the road to a whole new relationship with Jesus. An encouraging word enables an addict to take the first step towards recovery from addiction. A childless couple takes a risk of fostering a child for a weekend and ends up with a house full of kids for the rest of their lives. Two awkward teens hang out at the same school dance and 50 years later, they celebrate a golden milestone. A friend mentions a job posting they had seen that matches what they think might be your skill set, and you start a whole new career. A priest invites you to accept the role of reading one Sunday morning, and you end up becoming a lay reader. I arrived on a visitor's visa in Canada in 1986. And because I was unable to teach, which was my former profession, or attend university in Canada, I started an honors degree by correspondence in religious studies at a university in South Africa, where back in those days, I actually had to put my assignment in the mail and trust that it would get all the way from Canada to South Africa. At the same time, I began volunteering at my local parish and heard God calling me in a whole new way. If I asked any one of you how that crucial day began, no doubt you would say, just like any other. No doubt Isaiah thought he would just drop into the temple for a moment. God, the Holy Spirit can be sneaky in that way, and we should be alert, lest God start a new thing without us. The last 16 months of pandemic has been an extraordinary time in our world that has literally upended it. It has upended the way we are and the way we live. We will never be the same again. Just as people were not the same after the 1918 Spanish flu, the Great Depression, the First and Second World War, and all those other defining moments in history. But I say to you today that the pandemic has also been a Kairos moment, a pivot point which has the potential to change the arc of our story 
and move it in a new direction. And so I invite us all to enter fully into the life of the Trinity, as Isaiah did. What are we noticing around us in our local, national, and wider context? And more importantly, what is our calling and our vocation in this moment? What is God calling us to do and say and be? I want to suggest that first we stand with Isaiah and admit our brokenness and the brokenness of our world and ask for forgiveness. And then with burning lips, a forgiven people to be the eyes and ears and voice, messengers of God. First, to engage in the words of Walter Brueggemann in his book, Virus as a Summons to Hope, to engage in relentless and uncompromising hope, which according to Walter Brueggemann is more than an assurance that we will get through this time, but actually that we speak with conviction that God will not quit until God has arrived at God's good intention. There is a purpose at work in this pandemic. And that holy purpose is tenacious, steadfast, and relentless. And the second thing I believe we are being called to do is to be witnesses to the abiding, tenacious solidarity of God, the God who persists and who will never let us go. But that witness is a witness that is performed in both word and deed. There is a beautiful hymn in common praise that I want to close with by reading the first verse of it. It's number 466. How clear is our vocation, Lord? It goes like this. How clear is our vocation, Lord, when once we heed your call to live according to your word and daily learn refreshed, restored, that you are Lord of all and will not let us fall. May the blessed Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with each one of you this day and always. Amen. Thank you, Archbishop Ann, for those wonderful words. I just want to sit with them for a while and let them. And you know, it's a good thing about, about the way we are worshiping right now is that we can go back and listen to them again and hear them again. Thank you so much. I invite you to join me now as we say the creed and to notice as we say it, that it is a statement of our belief in the Trinity on this Trinity Sunday. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
We now take time to pray for our own needs and those of others. In peace, we pray to you, Lord. We remember all those whose work it is to support and care for others, especially in this challenging time. For all people in their daily life and work. For our families, our friends, and our neighbors, and for all those who are alone. Remembering all those who make decisions and all those who make choices so that we may get along as part of a society of justice and peace. For this community, our country and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless and the needy. On this Trinity Sunday, we remember especially the parishes of Trinity All Saints, Bala and the Reverend Heather Manuel, Holy Trinity, Sault Ste. Marie, and the Reverend Claire Miller, Trinity Church, Perry Sound, the Reverend Dr. David Hardy, Reverend Carol Hardy, and the Reverend Dr. Frank Thompson, and Holy Trinity, Temiskaming. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. And for all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. Among the many dioceses and national churches of our communion, we remember today La Iglesia Anglicana de Mexico, the Anglican Church of Mexico. For Anne, our Archbishop, and for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God in God's church. For our own needs and the needs of others. And I invite you to add in silence or aloud those petitions that are most on your own heart. Hear us, Lord, for your mercy. For your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. Again, I invite you to give voice in whatever way to those things for which you are most thankful. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all those who have died in the peace of Christ, for those whose faith is known to you alone, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them who put their trust in you. Gracious God, you hear the prayers of your faithful people. You know our needs before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Grant us our requests as may be best for us. This we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God of unchangeable power, you have revealed yourself to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Keep us firm in this faith that we may praise and bless your holy name. Trinity of love, maker of man and woman in your image, help us to accept ourselves as we are and to know our need for each other. Father, you sent your son to bring us truth and your spirit to make us holy. Open our hearts to exalt you. Open our lives to reveal you, our one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Eternal and glorious God, you dwell in a high and holy place, yet 
draw us near in your beloved Son. We humble ourselves before you and pray that we may know your loving presence, creator, redeemer, and life giver, our one true God forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. Guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that in all the cares and occupations of our life, we may not forget you, but may remember that we are ever walking in your sight through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now the blessing. Send us anywhere you would have us go. Only go there with us. Place upon us any burden you desire. Only stand by us to sustain us. Break any tie that binds us, except the tie that binds us to you. And may the blessing of God the creator who made us and knows us, the savior who redeems and befriends us, and the spirit who enlightens and sustains us. Be with us always, today and every day. Amen. And our final hymn for this morning, All Creatures of Our God and King. Creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing.
We thank you for being with us this morning, and we're especially thankful to Archbishop Anne for joining us and providing us with those wonderful words. I encourage you to go to the diocesan website and check the, um, Archbishop Anne's most recent letter there. I think you'll find much encouragement in it and lots of hope for the day when we will be able to meet together again in, per in person. But for now, we're so thankful to be able to meet together in this way. Now, my friends, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>